Hi, everybody, and welcome to this conversation we're having today with Rich Stern, the president of World Vision, and I'm Gabe Lyons with Q Ideas. And we are really uh, glad to have this opportunity to really dig in kind of be beyond the stories we see in the headlines to what's happening with this refugee crisis. We're hearing about it on the news, but it's important to take a much deeper look, especially at the church, to try to figure out what does it mean for us to engage this and to be very informed. And over these next 30 minutes, I think you're going to find yourself very informed about what's happening and what can be done. I'd like to welcome Rich Stearns. Hey, Gabe. Thanks. Uh, great to join you today to talk about this really important topic. Um, Rich, I think like so many other people, I was horrified when I saw that photograph of a three-year-old boy who had washed up on this Turkish beach, and the whole world immediately took notice uh, to this crisis that you know, back in April, you were with us in Boston at Q Boston, and you actually shared this. We had an 18 minute conversation specifically around this refugee crisis at a time when I sensed in you a lot of frustration that the church people are not paying attention. This is significant. What's happening? Um, what do you think this moment is doing for this bigger understanding about the refugee crisis? Well, Gabe, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've been struggling to support the Syrian refugees fleeing from the region for now four and a half years. And it has been extraordinarily hard to get the attention of the American public uh, on this issue. And what the death of that three-year-old boy did, and his name was Aylan Kurdi, uh, it put a face on this crisis, a human face, the face of a child. And uh, I think for the first time in in the last few years, uh, Americans realized uh, that these were men, women, and children that were literally fleeing for their lives. And, uh, uh, you know, Joseph Stalin once said that a million deaths is a statistic, uh, but one death is a tragedy. And uh, we have seen hundreds of thousands of deaths in this conflict in Syria uh, but the tragedy of this little boy's death, I think, put a face and a human face on this conflict for all of us to see. And so it's unfortunately was a very important milestone in uh, grabbing the attention of the American public and the American church on this issue. You know, I think most people, myself included, um, didn't always understand the scope of where these refugees are coming from. I mean, we're now hearing the news stories about showing up in Europe. But as you said, you've been working for four and a half years. And so much of the refugees are coming out of Syria. I think I just read recently 52% of the refugees, men, women, and children, are coming directly out of Syria and fleeing that land. Can you, can you help educate us a little bit more on the scope of just the facts on the ground, what's happening with this crisis? Yeah, and I think most people don't understand. Uh, the politics are very complicated here in the Middle East, and you don't really need to understand all of them. But there is a civil war going on in Syria that has just been brutal. And it has driven 12 million people from their homes, 12 million people. These are men, women, and children. In fact, half of the refugees are children. Half of them are children. Now, just to compare to the Haiti earthquake uh, in 2010, which really drew the world's attention, there were about a million people that were made homeless because of the Haiti earthquake, about a million. So this is 12 times larger as a humanitarian crisis than Haiti was. Um, right now, they are fleeing uh, the refugees, uh, mostly from Syria, uh, some from Iraq, and most of them are fleeing into the neighboring countries. These would be Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey are the countries that have received the most refugees. Lebanon, for example, one out of five people in Lebanon right now are refugees from the Syrian crisis. 20% of the entire population of that country now are refugees. Uh, interestingly, uh, only a few percent have made it to Europe. So it's probably less than 3% uh, have actually tried to get into Europe where most of the attention has been focused right now. But 97% are still in the region and, and, and needing help. Uh, World Vision is working throughout the Middle Eastern countries uh, with the refugees. Uh, we're trying to provide the basic necessities of life, uh, food, water, sanitation, basic access to health care. And of course, our focus is always on children to protect children who are so vulnerable at times like this. So that has been our focus uh, as we've worked in Lebanon, as we've worked uh, inside Syria, and, and we've worked in Jordan in particular. We have a new response now in Serbia, where some of the refugees are going through Serbia, trying to get into Hungary and then into Europe. So we're trying to be very flexible and very fluid in this. And I just want to do one more thing 
because statistics really don't describe what's happening. They're important. Uh, but this is a human crisis. The, the greatest human suffering in our world today is, is right in this region because of this terrible civil war. Uh, when I was in the refugee camps in Jordan a, a ways back, uh, a little girl named Haya, who was 10 years old, wrote me a letter. And I just want to read an excerpt from her letter. It will just tug at your heart. She said, peace to you. I am talking on behalf of Syrian children. I'm calling on you, the people of the other world. Have you ever thought of Syria? Have you ever thought of the children of Syria, my country, Syria? Syria is in pain. Syria is bleeding. Syria is crying for her children. Her children were her candles and they have faded out. Please, she said, my name is Haya and my father was killed. I want to go back to Syria. I loved my father so much. This little girl is emblematic of the six million children now that have been displaced. Many of them have seen loved ones killed. Uh, they've seen horrible violence right before their very eyes. And now they're fleeing with the clothes on their back. They're living in flimsy tents. Uh, and the real suffering here is uh, the suffering of children. Yeah, well, Rich, thank you for giving us the bigger scope, I think, of, of what's happening. And I'm glad to introduce Wen Flatten, who's with us today. He's part of the World Vision team. He's actually lived in the Middle East for quite some time and been a big part of coordinating how we're engaging with the stories on the ground, with these real families, real people, refugee camps. And Wen, uh, welcome to this conversation. I'd love for you to just give us a little bit of an overview of what's taking place um, in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq, um, Lebanon, some of the activities that you guys are involved in and, and what we need to know about what's happening on the ground. Uh, well, thank you, Gabe. It's uh, nice to be here. Um, World Vision's response actually started in March of 2011 in Lebanon, uh, where we had a well-established office. But as we've been able to see from this crisis, um, the, the crisis is not confined by borders and it's flowing over everywhere. So in 2013, uh, we started uh, responding to the refugee needs in Jordan, and we opened up an office in Turkey to be able to work cross-border in North Syria. And then in the summer of 2014, uh, when people were fleeing the violence um, in, uh, nor in Iraq and in northern Syria, we opened up in the Kurdish region of, uh, of Iraq as well. And uh, now just uh, a week or so ago, we started uh, doing some response up in, up in, uh, up in uh, uh, Serbia as well. Um, since the onset of, of the response, uh, the World Vision's response, we have um, actually uh, provided assistance to approximately 2.3 million people. And it sounds like a great number. And yet it's in a sense, it's a drop in the bucket because the needs are so great and there's, and there's so many people and you can give an assistance for a short time, but if people don't have some type of stability longer term, eventually they have to wonder what does the future hold? Um, as Rich had mentioned, um, our focus has been on water and sanitation, uh, access to food and cash, provision of basic necessities like clothing and shelter and hygiene kits. And one, uh, one day I was in, in the, the Zatri camp and I went to the storehouse and they were talking about diapers. And I thought, well, gee whiz, you know, who, who, who gives a second thought to diapers? And yet today is my uh, granddaughter's second birthday. She's two years old today. And I thought if you took all the diapers out of the city um, where, where, one of us, where one of us lived, what would it be like? What would the families do? And I suddenly realized that even the small things in life for these children and for these families are so important. And um, in terms of, the, you know, we, we focus on the well-being of children with World Vision. And to the extent possible, uh, we, we try to provide a, either a child-friendly space where children can come and play and you, it's brightly colored and you can see the kids there and yet you know that when the two hours is finished, they have to go back to a tent or someplace. And so it's, it's, a, it's a brief beacon of, of light in their life that doesn't last long. And we're also doing um, remedial education because every child we talk to says that they want to go to school. They come from an area where there was access to education. And so they've lost all of this. So the trauma on children is... Um, is quite is quite significant, and I think you know this is particularly concerning in a way because the children of today will build the Syria of tomorrow, and when you know we need to all be concerned about well how well equipped are they going to be for that task? 
So this is um, this is a, a huge humanitarian tragedy, and the assistance that's provided is simply not enough. And when I think one of the things we quickly assume when we hear about such a crisis and refugees is that they would just immediately want to leave their land and go somewhere else, go to Europe, go wherever. But the, for the majority, number one, that's not possible because they can't afford to find a way to leave. Uh, many of the children, obviously, and women are just more vulnerable. It's going to be a harder journey. Uh, but third, many of them don't want to leave their land. They don't They don't want to give up on the fact that one day they want to be back in Syria. And that's where I know the, the refugee camps that World Vision's a part of establishing and serving um, become, uh, that becomes a familiar story, right? Of people just hanging on to some sense of hope that they will be able to go back into their land. Um, that's right. And, and uh, for example, the, the letter that Rich wrote, you know, there are so many children when you sit down and talk to them, they talk about they want to go back to Syria because that's what they know. And they remember the fondness of their childhood. They've had family members that have been killed. And so to look to look to 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 move out of the region, to to stay in a camp for them is not really an option. Um, tell us a little bit more about uh, how, you know, people within you know, the, the, the people who are leaving um, Syria and they're living in, in the camps or the refugee camps that you've been a part of helping establish, um, what are some of the real needs that funding helps provide, like very specifically? Because I know World Vision, you have a lot of staff, a lot of people on the ground. Um, but one of the things I've, I've learned in this process is that some of the funding that governments used to provide to this sort of work has actually um, it's less funding is happening from world governments towards this kind of a crisis. And so when the funds start to go away, what are some of the basic necessities that just aren't accessible for people? Well, one of the things that's often not realized is that most of the refugees actually live in host communities. They do not live in camps. And so uh, when they move into a host community, they will compete for jobs. Um, although although in, legally they're not supposed to work, but it puts a strain on the on the water system and puts a strain on on rent. Um, the refugees will work at very, very low wages um, sort of in the underground economy. And so it puts an incredible amount of stress on the host countries as well. And uh, so when the for example, the, the World Food Program has had to cut um, the amount of rations, uh, the, the value of rations, and it went from. Uh, to twenty-seven dollars down to down to nineteen dollars, then it dropped to thirteen dollars and fifty cents in Lebanon. Well, that's per person, and if you think about well, what can you actually do with fifty cents a day? It makes it almost untenable for people to uh, to remain there. And even in reading in the in the news articles today and yesterday, and then people say, well, we just can't we just can't survive here anymore. So whatever it takes, we have to try to go, even if they don't have money to do it, which is where some of the risky uh, most risky travel uh, takes place. Now, one area for people to just understand a little bit more about the region that we're talking about is, is some of these countries, they're mostly Muslim majority. Um, however, Syria and Lebanon, historically, they've had quite a significant Christian presence amongst those populations. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the faith dynamics on the ground? Sure. Um, First of all, you know, the Christ, as you mentioned, the Christians have, have always been in this part of the world and they've always been a minority. And yet to stay here, it means actually that they have to be a part of the social fabric and live among people of other faiths. And they've been able to do this historically. Um, world Vision in our work right now, it, we, we serve people regardless of race, uh, regardless of creed, religion or gender. And I think this sends a message to the, to the, to the groups that are not Christian that that we care for all people, that Christians care for all people. So in fact, um, you know, a majority of the people who benefit from our assistance at this point in time are probably people from other faiths, primarily uh, Muslims. But, but it's amazing how many religious leaders um, who, who are not Christian will say they how much they realize the richness of faith diversity in this area um, requires that Christians stay, and they definitely do not want the Christians to be. Um, also, the churches um, in the host communities have done an incredible job taking in fellow believers who have fled. Um, in the Kurdish region of Iraq, I, I was last year in, in August, I visited a church that two weeks before just received 39 families, and they were all staying in one room. And so we had helped build a sanitation and water facility there, and the people are still there. 
there's another church in Urbel where there's 700 people living in the church ground and 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 we've been able to put in uh, 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 volleyball courts and places in places for kids to hang out and for people to socialize and so it's almost become the center of, of the whole community um, and and uh, in Lebanon and Jordan uh, we've provided psychosocial support for for families to be able to protect their children in these very uncertain circumstances. Quite frankly, you know, almost every family has been traumatized either by a, by the loss of a family member or whatever. And when you're living in a tent, you know, the whole the whole business of well, how shall we then live um, comes up. And so we've tried to support families in that. And ultimately, you know, the the, the we want Christians to thrive in a multi faith community uh, and be able to rebuild a country. Um, that is that is lost so much, and so we want them. You know, we believe that that they would be an integral part of the community. They believe they would be that way, and so we we hope that that doesn't get lost. Well, Lynn, this is what I love and rich too about the World Vision approach is that it's always long term. It's not just about the momentary crisis, although you show up in the crisis. But there's a thinking to all of the development work that goes into World Vision that these are long term projects where you're raising children to think a certain way about how to advance good within their communities through every type of sector that's needed, whether it's medical or education. Uh, and in doing that, even here in this crisis, there's that sense of long-term thinking that the children that you're helping today will be the ones who make a lot of decisions about how they think about their society going forward, how they think about faith. Um, and I just appreciate the approach that you take. I think it's a great model for us to learn from even in the U.S. to understand what does it mean for us to help and support and love neighbors, even if we might disagree with them theologically or philosophically? Um, but that's where the love of God uh, goes forward in a beautiful way. Um, you know, Rich, I, you, you, we hear all of this. It's obviously overwhelming, I think, for everybody listening um, to to especially for American Christians and those who live in Western uh, societies to even even grasp the ramifications of this. I think of like the first century Christians, you know, as you were describing when. Uh, what's taking place there in Syria, that you have uh, Christians who were the ones in the first century when the plagues came that served uh, the, the pagans or served those who did not believe and gave them food and water when they were in the midst of their distress. And it was over time that all the doctors, everybody else fled the cities. And it was actually the Christians who, through their love and kindness and compassion and even risking their own lives, um, actually brought about a revolution of the Christian faith in Roman cities because they stayed. And that's what I see you describing right now is, is Christian presence in the midst of this very difficult circumstance. Um, Rich, tell us a little bit more about how we in these sort of more comfortable Western environments right now who feel our hearts um, ripped apart as we understand the crisis. What, what is it that we can do? How can we play a part? How can we support um, this work? Well, thanks, Gabe, and, and thanks, Wynn, for that great kind of eyewitness report about what's happening there. But um, uh, first of all, I, I think we have to keep the human face of this crisis in our hearts. And uh, we need to be in prayer for the Syrian people uh, and for all of the refugees uh, in the region. We need to be in prayer for the indigenous church. Uh, as Wynn indicated, uh, the indigenous church in these countries uh, is struggling right now with just the, uh, the the onslaught of so many people coming in and so much human need to be met. And so uh, we need to be supportive of them as well as they try to figure out how they can contribute to this. And Gabe, your comments about our witness uh, in this uh, are, are tremendous because uh, what an opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ to demonstrate God's love to people who really need it right now in their lives. And as those children grow up, they will never forget those expressions of love and concern and care uh, that we're able to show them in their time of need. And wouldn't we want the same thing if we were in that moment of need? Uh, wouldn't we be so grateful if uh, some outsiders came alongside us and said, we're here for you. Uh, we got your back. We want to help get you through this. So uh, remember to pray for these people. Uh, as I've watched the news coverage the last few nights, and refugees are interviewed by the national news media, almost every one of them wants to say, we are human beings too. Uh, we want to live too. And they don't wanna be classified as refugees uh, or immigrants or migrants. They, they wanna be seen as human beings. But right now, uh, the work that we're doing uh, is hard to sustain financially. And so we're inviting people to give. And uh, if you go to our website at worldvision.org, 
you can become a global refugee responder. And uh, no matter who you are, you can make a, a monthly gift or a one-time gift, but we encourage people to consider giving $15 a month, $25 a month, whatever you can afford, uh, and be a refugee responder that enables organizations like World Vision to continue this great work, uh, to come alongside churches in the Middle East, uh, to give these refugee uh, children and families hope. Well, I would add to that, Rich. I know, I know. You know, we all want to do something, and and we look around the corner in our American neighborhoods, for example, and it's like, what can I do? How can I take in a family? Um, and and what can our church do? And I think we should be thinking about that. I think we should, in our churches throughout America, be thinking about what are we doing with refugees in our own cities? Some who've existed before this crisis took place or became aware to people. What is it? And is there a demonstration of true love and compassion tangibly? Um, giving money towards something like this is exactly the kind of tangible expression that also makes a huge difference. Um, it's it, The thing I love about World Vision, again, and why Q is partnered with World Vision, is there's a long-term approach. The fact that you guys were there four years ago when this was just beginning and have established networks of churches and relationships, there's an infrastructure on the ground that l literally just gets leveraged more quickly, more resources flow to the people who need it. Um, that only comes through us helping give and support and financially just uh, immeasurably try to get those resources into people's hands. And so um, I appreciate, Rich, your work and when your work in the field. I know there's so many others that you represent uh, who have sacrificed their lives, who work tirelessly um, into the middle of the night to serve families, to help with medical situations, to um, help with children who don't have parents anymore and have crisis counseling. I mean, there's so much that you guys are doing. Um, thank you on behalf of sort of Americans and the church here for what you're doing. Uh, and I want to say, you know, another way for those who are listening who might be pastors or maybe you're a leader in your church, uh, that one of the things World Vision has put together that you can see on their website um, at worldvision.org slash church is a way for your church to participate. Um, uh, they've created something called Refugee Sunday that's designed for you to specifically uh, help expose more of your people who maybe couldn't be a part of a call like this. Um, and a hangout that they could actually see for themselves some of the stories that are taking place and make this more personal for people um, so that they can take action as well. And so check that out. And I know for us, Rich, next week we do our Q Commons event, which will happen in 70 cities around the world, many in the U.S. And one of the things just in this last week we've, we've added is a whole conversation specifically around this crisis and what does it mean for us as Christians um, to engage it. And so excited to just continue to spread the word and do exposure, but it, it ultimately needs to lead to action. It needs to lead to each of us taking steps to do that. Do you have any final words or thoughts you'd like to share, Rich? No, I just appreciate that, Gabe. And uh, yeah, that church resource uh, site is terrific. It's got videos and all kinds of materials that help explain and communicate what's really going on in, in the region. So uh, thanks for the time, uh, Gabe, and uh, we look forward to uh, I uh, hope you have a great conference uh, later in the month uh, in the Q, Q conversations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rich. And I would just say for those of you watching this, if you've appreciated just some of the education and learning that you've been able to have, you can copy and paste this link, send it to your friends, send it out in an email newsletter uh, to the folks who are part of your community so that they can actually benefit from some of this in-depth conversation from the field. Thank you, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.